events and you are being recorded, uh, given the fact that it's a webinar, nobody will see the audience, they will see us, which is fine. My name is Dr. Eli Saltzman. I'm the director of the Gildenhorn Institute for Israel Studies at the University of Maryland at College Park. I want to thank a couple of people who work tirelessly behind the scenes. Avis Koyman, our uh, indispensable helper, assistant, coordinator, uh, Wonder Woman. Uh, I also want to thank Max Grossman. Um, and let's get, get, get the ball rolling, as, as one would say. Um, watching the horrifying events that unfolded in Israel and Gaza has been extremely difficult and emotionally draining for all of us. Both our students and our faculty convey to us a sense of helplessness as well as hopelessness, if you wish, given the magnitude of the events and their unfolding implications. The Gildenhorn Institute is dedicated to a multidisciplinary study and research of modern Israel, and our faculty offer a variety of scholarly perspectives and methodologies to realize that mission. We also offer engaging programming that highlights different aspects of modern Israel. And given the events in Israel and the Gaza Strip, we felt it was our responsibility to engage our community on and off campus and help us all reflect and address the conflict. Today's special event kind of consists of two main segments. First, our speakers will uh, I'll introduce them in a moment. We'll introduce their own perspective, their own views on the conflict. And then we'll open up the conversation to have an exchange between the speakers, between the faculty. The objective is neither to, to achieve a consensus or engage in kind of a, an argument just for the sake of the argument, but rather to engage in a conversation. Neither speaker was instructed what to say or what aspect of the war to address or how, this might be a difficult and possibly uncomfortable conversation given the nature of the events we'll address, but what we seek is a dialogue among scholars who hopefully will help us understand the last week or so and learn something new. This is what we do in the classroom. This is what we try to do throughout our programming, and I hope we can accomplish this today as well. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A, um, and I'll try to moderate as soon as we switch to the second part of the event, as I said, which is kind of a more open, informal conversation. So let me first introduce this first speaker of this evening. It gives me great pride and, and, and pleasure to introduce Dr. Mia Bloom. She's an International Security Fellow at the New America and a professor at Georgia State University. She conducts research in Europe, the Middle East, and South Asia, and speaks eight languages. She's the author of six books and 80 articles on violent extremism. Her next book, Veiled Threats, Women and Jihad, is scheduled for publication by Cornell University Press in 2024. Bloom is a former term member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and has held appointments at Cornell, Harvard, Princeton, and McGill universities. She serves on the counter-radicalization boards of the Anti-Defamation League, the UN Counterterrorism Executive Directorate, Women Without Borders, and several working groups for the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism. Mia, the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saltzman. And, and first of all, I wanna thank you for the invitation. I've actually, um, had refused everything for the first uh, week or so. I just uh, couldn't really uh, uh, muster up the enthusiasm to talk about this. And so my first thought is for all the civilians, both in Israel and in Gaza, who are suffering. And it's been very difficult. So let me try to um, focus my comments in a constructive way and not be overly emotional about the whole thing. Um, I think that what we're seeing is a catastrophe built on another catastrophe built on another catastrophe. So it's it's very bad. It's bad for all the people involved. It's bad for the international community who is either sitting by or being pulled in in one way or the other. And especially if you think about the fact that um, 
the number of civilians who have been targeted and killed either deliberately or through willful disregard uh, has been astonishing. And I don't think we've seen anything like this in a very long time. So uh, I think, you know, just I'm going to default and be less brave and refer to people uh, like Ian Lustig, who has said that we shouldn't just look at the situation starting from October 7th till now, but maybe look at the big picture and understand the context and by no means justifying any violence that has been perpetrated about against Israel, but understanding it within the larger context of the conflict is maybe a little bit more helpful because otherwise it just looks like the most horrific, disgusting terrorist attack, which it was, but it's confusing. So I think that it's important Here's my here's the distinction I'm I make. Um, we've seen a number of instances in the last few years since 2006, when Israel left Gaza, that uh, Israelis will routinely bomb infrastructure. Uh, whether there's evidence that Hamas has used civilians as human shields, whether Hamas has hidden their material or anything in dual use apartment buildings. We know, for example, the destruction of either Al Jazeera or other news you know, like buildings in which uh, the news headquarters were is problematic at best. But this has sort of become rather routine. And I think that what happened is in the last, let's say eight months or so, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, the much beleaguered prime minister of Israel, and we talk about how many counts against Trump. I mean, th this man has been proven to be uh, guilty on so many different corruption charges, but he has refocused a lot of his attention to the West Bank, leaving almost um, a security vacuum in the South. And I think there was an assumption that um, the project of Israel's expansion of continued illegal settlements, um, placing people like Smotrich and Ben Gvir, who are in his in his cabinet, who are known to be, you know, supremacist, supremacists and racists and horrific individuals, not just towards Palestinians and Muslims, but also towards the LGBT community, towards secular people. Um, and in doing so, offered an opportunity to have this attack in Gaza. And depending on who you speak to, it's been anywhere from a year to two years in the planning. And the fact that um, even the head of the uh, Isidine al-Qasim brigades was not informed of the full plan. And so we have this kind of template where a lot of the planning, a lot of the strategy was done in such a way as to limit the number of people who were in the know so that there could be no leakage. Because we know that uh, many of the security apparatuses in Israel have thoroughly penetrated the Palestinian towns and villages. And in this particular case, there was no information. But I think also the timing is interesting, you know, and again, uh, uh, my, my, my closest friend who's an expert on Al-Qaeda and just read, read a, wrote a book on uh, the Abbottabad papers, you know, was surprised. She thought maybe that, you know, it had been planned within two weeks. And I thought, it's it's unlikely. I mean, a plan of this level of sophistication, and when I say sophistication, obviously I don't want to give the impression that there's any kind of admiration. I just mean it's complex. Uh, can't be put together in two weeks because Bibi Netanyahu held up a map at the UN, which basically erased Palestinian existence. So, it, you know, I'm sure that it's not that people saw the map and said, okay, we should do something, as well as the fact that it coordinated in terms of the of the dates to the October surprise or the 1973 Yom Kippur War. So I think that there's a few things, you know, I remember being at Princeton when 9-11 happened. And the first thing everyone did was try to figure out what, what significance was that date? You know, so there is something to do, you know, when I was first writing about terrorism you know, many years ago, um, there's two different kinds of planning. There's planning that is a reaction to something that's happened. And then there's planning that's long-term that is almost like, um, I call it the, uh, the slow release tablet, you know, the Tylenol slow release. In other words, you have it planned and you're either waiting for the excuse or waiting for the anniversary. So that in terms of the planning, sophistication was absolutely the case. I think the other thing is 
and and this is where I'm going to say something potentially unpopular, and I'm ready to accept whatever the reaction is. Um, I do see a different as difference between the willful disregard for civilian life that Israel has shown time and time again when it bombs Gaza and it bombs civilian infrastructure. I do see a difference between that and deliberately going into um, a music festival to seek out civilians and kill teenagers. Now, I know that this is the difference between, let's say, in, in the law, you know, murder one, murder two. They're both murder and they're both awful. But I do see something of a difference. And I do think that also the kidnapping of young people, of the girls, the way that some of this taped information has come to light with the media, what they're saying they're gonna do to the girls, we know violates Islamic law in terms of prisoners. And so that Hamas is violating Islamic law in order to do some unspeakable things to civilians, I think uh, we're not gonna know the full extent of it for a while. But I also think that I'm not sure how productive it has been for the last week to debate, were the children beheaded? Were they immolated? Were they both burnt and beheaded? How many? Is this a real news, fake news? I, I found that to be an unproductive conversation and in kind of ghoulish. And so as someone who studies terrorism and is rather, I don't wanna say immune, but at least uh, accustomed to these horrific things, I found it very triggering and I found it very difficult. The other thing has been, I think for many people in the academy, some of the reaction, um, not among my friends, but people who are encountering, you know, I would differentiate Palestinian rights from Hamas. I don't think Hamas has Palestinian self-determination as its primary goal. Uh, I don't think that this attack is going to further Palestinian rights and certainly does it endangers Palestinians because you know when when you engage in an attack of this level, the fact that there's going to be a retaliation or response is a given. But I'm also very uncomfortable with the flip side that we've seen, let's say, in the United States among some Republican uh, congressmen and senators who want to turn Gaza into a parking lot. Again, the, the Gazan civilians were not responsible for this. This is a particular you know, tranche of, of Hamas that engaged in this. And you know, um, the last thing, you know, just to say, this is not a new position that I'm taking of making this differentiation. When I first started my PhD, and I'll tell you that in the 90s, nobody was interested in terrorism. I'd been studying it since the 80s, but I got to Columbia University and my, my committee wasn't particularly interested. And a, a close friend of mine from high school who was kidnapped by Hamas and tortured and killed. And so people's reaction was, well, you know, we should bomb the Palestinians. And, you know, my reaction in, in 1990 was to say, or 91, sorry, was to say absolutely not. This is not all the Palestinians that killed Jason. Jason was killed by this, you know, niche group. And I think it's important that as we're thinking about the response, we also think about the fact that we cannot endanger civilians because ultimately this is what terrorists do. They want the state to overreact. This was true of, of Israel and Hamas. This is true of Shining Path. This is true of every terrorist group that wants the state to prove them right. Um, I'm going to stop here and, and thank everyone. I'm out of time and I'm happy to answer more questions, but um, I, I managed to get through it, with, through it without crying, so I'm calling it a win. Thank you so much, uh, Mia Bloom. Thank you so much. Our uh, next speaker is our very own Scott Lesensky. Dr. Lesensky is a lecturer at the University of Maryland, teaching about Israel, the United States, and Jewish American politics. He also works as an advisor and educator for ENTER, the Jewish Peoplehood Alliance, he was also a U.S. diplomat focusing on Israel under President Barack Obama. He was a visiting fellow at the Israel Institute for National Security, or INSS, and previously a resident scholar and program leader at the U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington and the Council of Foreign Relations in New York. 
Scott, my friend, the stage is yours. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Eli. Um, and I want to thank the others who joined, uh, all the participants, but especially Mia right now, because she just um, helped me loosen up a little bit and not give such a formulaic talk. So let, let me add just a couple of quick points before I start. I prepared some answers to questions that Eli posed to us. Um, when I was a diplomat in Israel, the second of the two assignments I had in the US government, uh, the home that we lived in, the US government provided home, didn't have a bomb shelter, didn't have a safe room, even though it's code in Israel, but through some bizarre quirk of uh, diplomatic immunity. Um, and after the 2014, um, a very long, very devastating war in Gaza, which was 50 plus days, the US did not evacuate dependents, but was close to doing so. The absence of uh, safe rooms and homes was identified as a problem. So our, you know, ours was built and all the American diplomatic residences were hardened. And I remember at the, at the ribbon cutting, the home that my family lived in was the first home to get the, the bomb shelter, not the ribbon cutting. I remember turning to a colleague and saying, um, you know, with some seriousness that even though we're in, in a way celebrating the building of this room, that unlike if we were at the British or the Belgian or any other embassy, it's our responsibility of the United States to either prevent the next conflict or to bring it to as quick um, of an end as possible. Um, I'm going to speak, I'm going to divide my comments between uh, what's happening on the Jewish American scene and the Jewish diaspora scene and the US government, partly because I teach in both of those realms and very engaged. Um, and I'll try to, uh, I'll try to, um, 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 I'll, I'll try to draw on the inspiration, you know, we're all kind of on overload and I've been reading everything that comes my way. Uh, our own colleague at the University of Maryland, Paul Sham, wrote a, an early piece speaking about this moment as an inflection point. So I'm also going to try to, even though I look to the past, as most scholars and policymakers do, I'm going to try to remain flexible, not knowing that the, um, you know, the past may not be um, the guy that it, that it is sometimes. Um, um, Okay, uh, real quick, three points on the on the Jewish American scene, on Jewish American politics, on the diaspora response. Um, you're seeing right now, number one, a cohesive response. You're seeing a tremendous degree of what one of my colleagues in Israel, um, Ezra Kapelowitz, uh, who's a scholar and a pollster, calls the peoplehood of solidarity. Um, I brought actually a, I have a little device to show. This is from yesterday's Washington Post and the New York Times, an ad from Ronald Lauder. It's it's a big, large, full-page ad. You know, probably only older people who still get print editions of the newspaper uh, have been seeing it. But the messages there, the messages of solidarity and unity, are being widely um, heard. They're being heard if you look at messages of political advocacy groups, left and right, Jewish community groups, religious services group. You're kind of seeing it everywhere. You're seeing left and right lines blurred. Um, for the time being, like never before. And when I talk about the Jewish community response, I'm also, I'm informed by, as I teach in the class, um, in the classroom at the University of Maryland, you need to look at this, look at formal leaders, um, like Ambassador Lauder and the ad that I just showed, but also look for surrogates, look for proxies. We have public officials, J.J. Uh, Goldberg, who's a, uh, an, an author, a journalist, and editor that I use in my teaching at U University of Maryland. He talks about the the increasing presence of surrogate and proxy leaders of the American Jewish community. So take a Senator Jackie Rosen from Nevada or um, Senator Chuck Schumer. Uh, so number one, cohesion. Number two, you see mobilization. You see massive mobilization. And it's quite interesting at a time of, I would argue, peak division and fragmentation. We just went through the Jewish high holidays um, and in many synagogues, which are a forum of religious, uh, sorry, a forum for political discourse, but not a primary forum. Political discourse tends to happen through advocacy platforms, not, not within the religious sphere, but you saw all over this country during the Jewish high holidays, you saw religious leaders taking vocal positions, either for or against the policies of this current Israeli government. And in an instant, um, we, we pivot from uh, uh, fragmentation to cohesion. You see massive amounts of mobilization uh, the mobilization to support Israelis is also mixed in with mobilization at home, security around Jewish institutions. It's, it's mobilization that's focused internally as well as externally toward Israel. So one cohesion, two mobilization, and then three, I would say, here I'm going to lean in a little bit. This is something I'm not really certain about, but I see some adaptation of norms. I see, you know, take one norm in terms of mobilizing for Israel at a time of threat. 
uh, people want to go. Solidarity flights, solidarity missions. Um, young Jewish Americans, uh, many over the years, including today, have served in Israel's military. Um, I, I sense, I haven't seen any numbers, I'm just feeling anecdotes, there are some Israelis who will want to come out and maybe want to sit out this conflict. I even got a call today from a colleague who said uh, they know someone who's coming and the children may need schooling and all that. Um, the Jewish community, uh, with only a couple of exceptions, and there are some interesting exceptions to draw from, uh, summer of 2006, the war in the north, Israel-Lebanon, some Jewish communities took Israelis, took their children, brought them into summer camps, but for the most part, we're used to mobilizing and pointing that way and not so there's some, there could be some adaptation of norms and some 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 uh, ways to provide collective support that we're not sort of that the Jewish community is not um, not ready not not necessarily prepared for anyway a few, few quick comments pivoting from the diaspora scene to the to U.S. policy short term I'll just very quickly say I, I see effectively three main immediate diplomatic priorities for the United States um, one is shaping Israel's response to last Saturday's attack. Um, and here it's a mix of trying to balance our support for Israel's safety with avoiding um, what uh, my colleague Dan Kurtzer, and I, I don't know if I have to point to him, but he, he said it in writing. I think what's widely uh, seen all over our field, the, the prospects of humanitarian disaster, and that's kind of a delicate balance within a relationship that's a relationship um, uh, that's a very supportive one, it's an alliance, and yet we have lots of diplomatic obligations and equities. So shaping Israel's immediate response, and you see it, it's coming out now, the last 48 hours, particularly on the humanitarian side. Um, number one, number two, deterring spillover on the region. As bad as this conflict is across the Gaza-Israel frontier, um, um, a regional war or a two-front war would be exponentially more problematic. And you see that in rhetoric, we can't see what's happening behind the scenes, but in military deployments, um, so one, shaping Israel's immediate response, two, deterring spillover, um, and three, I would say um, there's, a, there's an American angle, there's a direct American angle now that we haven't seen in a lot of past conflicts in this arena specifically. There are Americans among the hostages, Americans who were killed, we're seeing the evacuation of, uh, of Americans uh, from the region, something that I, I don't recall, I'm hoping maybe one of the fellow speakers knows, maybe there's a 1973 metaphor, I'm not sure, but it's generally been avoided uh, in the past, um, haven't had this kind of level of lethality. Um, and that's what I would point to as short term. In the Q&A, if you want to get to the more medium term and longer term questions, there's no doubt the U.S. is going to be pivoting towards some very specific goals. And I, I think these goals are going to be quite different. They won't look like they looked in 2009, January, when President Obama took office. They won't look like when Hillary Clinton you know, negotiated a Thanksgiving uh, few hours before Thanksgiving ceasefire, and they certainly won't look like 2014 and 2021. Anyway, let me turn it back to you, Eli. Thank you so much, Scott, and even doing that right on time, I didn't need to pull my cards. Uh, our third speaker is Dr. Marwa Maziad. She's a visiting lecturer of visual studies at the University of Maryland, a non-resident scholar with the Middle East Institute's Defense and Security Program, and a senior faculty fellow at American University's Center for Israel Studies in Washington, DC. She specializes in comparative military civil relations with a focus on the United States, Egypt, Israel, Turkey, and the Gulf States. Dr. Maziad held academic faculty positions at Qatar University and Northwestern University in Qatar and published extensively on Middle East security affairs. In the spring, if I may plug this one in, she's offering a class on Israel in the media and social media for the first time. So I encourage our students uh, to think about that as well. It's a wonderful class and she's an excellent scholar and teacher. Maua, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Eli. Uh, it's uh, it's very hard time to, I can't say I'm glad to be here. It's actually, I'm almost dragged to, to speak drag to the class, uh, to teach, to engage at all. Um, I, it, 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 this, these events this time around, I mean, have an emotional toll on me. I, I did lose a, a very good friend from University of Washington, Chaim Katzman, um, uh, who was killed in the kibbutz in Israel. And um, I can trace that uh, before 
I knew about that. Uh, I was on BBC. I, I comment the news. I, I, I analyze things. And I was um, my objective detached self who looks at like the future of the map and what's going on and analyzing that this is a surprise attack. Um, this is uh, it's a sophisticated uh, uh, attempt from Hamas. It's not anything like anything before. It's not your run of the mill kind of terrorist uh, uh, attack. It has a strategic interest. It has. I I say I was thinking at least at the time that there is uh, you know geographical consequences to this um, uh, coming into Israel this way. I hadn't seen any of the pictures yet. I didn't learn about Chaim at the time, but I was looking at how uh, Hamas and 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 Gaza was carving itself. Uh, at a larger space, actually, now, now that we see the, the envelope, the Gaza envelope is vacated, I think there is even more resonance to that. But what I'm saying is that I was looking at it at, 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 at this very strategic level. What is what is the attack? What is going to become the attack? What's going to happen? But then uh, once you you have a person that you know, uh, and there is a story and there are voice and smiles and uh, it, it becomes very uh, close to you. But at the same time, it became also that the numbers I was looking at the screens, here is someone I know. And and it, by extension, also the numbers on Gaza. I, I didn't even uh, know that many Palestinians. I was always looking also at numbers on the screens and uh, who, who, who who's dying. It's a, it's a, it's like a piece of on the, on the chest or something. But I think with Chaim's uh, uh, killing, I, I, I felt very much for the Gazans and the Palestinians and uh, the stories and the voices and the tears and the smiles behind that as well. And um, I think this is the most important thing to say before we get, before I go back to the very strategic and the consequences and whatever, and I can take all of these questions and the regional uh, elements and all of that, but I just want to uh, reiterate what uh, Noi Katzman, uh, Haim's brother, said that he doesn't want um, uh, civilians in Gaza to be killed in the name of his brother. This is not the way to bring security and um, peace and happiness to the Israelis. And that's something very important because um, some people might feel guilty that they would have to, you know, be motivated by vengeance and attack and, and, and you know, uh, in his name, what would have he said? And um, but I think it's important to to listen to that and see that in pain, you can actually have empathy for the pain of others, not the other way around. And I, I was surprised by my own reactions, like I became more empathetic for everybody uh, because I know someone on one side. But um so I, I I will just start with that because it's I had to say that um, first, and then we we can get to all sorts of uh, implications and policies and politics in the Q and A. All righty, thank you so much, Mo Maziad. Uh, last but not least, also a very own of ours, Thela Buas. Um, he's a PhD candidate at the Department of Government and Politics in the Gillenhorn Institute for Israel Studies. His research focuses on identity politics in intractable conflicts, and his main research interest focuses on how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict helps shape values and beliefs among Israeli Jews. Mr. Abouas holds a master's degree from the University of Houston and a bachelor's degree from the University of Haifa, a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Mr. Abouas has worked in both civil society and government, so this is very interesting. Focusing on equal employment uh, opportunities for the Arab community, he advocates for a greater civil right for greater civil rights for minorities in Israel writ large. Phil, my friend, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, perfect. So <clears throat> I would also like to begin simply by reiterating that these are very tough times um, for all of us. Um, um, if you have friends, if you have relatives, um, please just um, you know give them a call or just ask them how they're doing because these are very very rough times, including for us that we are unfortunately used to 
many wars and military operations, but um, the last 10 days have been extremely difficult for all of us in a way that we have simply not, not experienced before. Um, like the others, I don't want to get into what exactly happened, uh, but instead I want to divide my talk into a number of themes that I feel that are important that um, we focus on, and maybe in the Q&A we can dive in a little bit more. So the first theme that I want to talk about um, 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 following the October 7th events is really the death of the conception um, of what, what has been known as managing the conflict. Um, there has been this myth that has been pushed through mainly by the Netanyahu government, but unfortunately, many others have adopted, whether in the international community, in the Arab world, in the United States, this myth of managing the conflict that somehow Instead of solving the actual problem, you can deal with the West Bank and with Gaza as two different polities of managing the conflict instead of solving it. And in the meantime, jump into other regional issues and, uh, and, and, and other regional dynamics of trying to reach uh, normalization deals. And somehow that would substitute um, um, for the situation in Israel-Palestine. That that um, this idea did not make sense back when um, when Netanyahu was pushing for it, and now unfortunately it exploded in our faces. It exploded in our faces because the Palestine question remains um, um, the main spoiler of instability of stability um, um, in our uh, in our region. Um, it is not the only issue, uh, it's not the only reason for the instability in the greater Middle East, but it remains the main uh, the main reason of uh, instability. Over the last two decades, there have been issues that have risen and we need to address them as well, but as long as we overlook this conflict, we're not gonna get um, anywhere um, in, our, uh, in our region. As a matter of fact, even before October 7th, the West Bank had experienced the worst, uh, the most violent uh, year um, over the, in the last two decades. In Jerusalem, we have already um, reached this say, phenomena where whenever there are um, um, religious events, we already know that tensions are going to happen and that there's going to be um, um, escalation in, in, in violence. So um, it's time that we change. Um, it, it's time that we change this um, notion that somehow managing the conflict will lead us anywhere. And this is probably the most important thing that we all have to. Um, understand following the events of October 7th. Um, another issue is that international and regional actors need to play a much larger role in solving this conflict. This whole idea of leaving these two sides to figure it out by themselves has not worked in the past um, and will not lead us anywhere. The gap between the two sides is, is, is large to begin with, and after October the 7th, it expanded even more. So we need good, uh, good faith international actors to come in and intervene. By good faith, I mean not actors that will take sides, but actors that will be assertive with both sides and make it clear that in order for us to have a better Middle East and better global security, it's time to address this issue um, in a very different manner. Another theme that I want to talk about is, is really the rise of the Tehran access or the resistance access, as it's known in the greater Middle East. Hamas was always seen as the step-sibling, if you wish, of the Iran axis. On the one hand, Hamas is a Sunni uh, Islamist organization, as opposed to the other members of the Tehran axis, which are more Shia-oriented or closer to Shia, such as the, the Houthis in Yemen or Zaydis. Um, Hamas, unlike, the, uh, the, unlike Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, does not have land border uh, access to Iran. Therefore, it was always harder for Iran to, um, to establish roots in Gaza. It does not have a maritime route as it does with Yemen. So, it, so Hamas was always seen as this outside peasant, if you wish, uh, of this Tehran axis. But it's quite clear that that has changed. The relationship, the dynamics of the relationship between Hamas and Iran have evolved so much over the last few years. Not many people have saw, have see, uh, have saw that. And now it's quite uh, clear the events of the last 10 days will pull Hamas even closer. Uh, to Tehran, um, and um, the, the only question is if, if Hamas truly is going to be beaten badly in, in this conflict, will that turn Hamas from an ally to a proxy of Iran? That's another question that uh, we need to think about. Um, and the reason for this is that Hamas has changed, actually. Many people are asking, well, what happened? Why did Hamas um, you know, um, um, do what, what it did? And I would argue that over the last few years, Hamas has witnessed a change in its leadership structure. Um, 
the traditional Hamas leadership, which I guess you can call the more Muslim Brotherhood esque leadership, which is currently in Qatar, people like Khalid Mash'al, Ismail Haniya, Musa Abu Marzouk, who, by the way, is an American citizen. Um, these guys have been sidelined. They might be the ones who, you know, you see on the media and whatnot, but they're really figureheads now. The people who are true, are in control of Gaza, are um, the military leadership of, of Izzeddin al Qassam, people like Yahya Sinwar, Muhammad Deir. These are the people who are truly in control, and these are the people who took the decision um, on October the 7th. And so the leadership of Hamas has moved, and in order for us to understand Hamas, we need to understand this this uh, this change. That that ship has sailed, and Hamas today is adopting much more unconventional policies than what we have seen in the past. Um, a third a third theme that I want to talk about, and I'm guessing I'm the only Israeli citizen um, in this panel. Um, so this is something that um, was clear to me, and that's the erosion of the Israeli state. That's one thing that we have seen over the last uh, 10 days. First of all, it took the Israeli military about seven or eight hours to actually respond to the situation on October uh, 7th. And that was something that survived, that surprised everybody, especially that, you know, the Southwestern Negev is an area or the Western Negev is an area that, you know, has um, military tension. So you would have expected a larger military presence, but that was not there. Um, and especially in the first hours and days, and even up to now, what we're seeing is that state institutions simply are not working in Israel. You know, Israel was always lauded as a country with a competent public sector um, that is able to provide government services, but that has not been uh, the case. Um, um, over the last 15 years, the reason for that is that over the last 15 years, um, 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 all these policies have been sidelined by more neoliberal policies, where people are expected to take control of their own faith without the, without the government uh, being there to help and interfere uh, and, and give people uh, solutions. Civil society has completely uh, replaced or substituted the government, and it is actually the one leading uh, the charge in Israel to provide basic services and needs, both to the population that has been evacuated, but even to uh, the Israeli uh, uh, military. And I believe that this is going to be a major internal issue in Israeli politics once uh, um, this war ends. How did the state, you know, um, completely is non-existent anymore when it comes to providing these basic services? And one final theme that I want to focus on is U.S. policy. Uh, I see that, Eli, thank you. Um, and here I want to be a little bit careful uh, because we're still in the middle of the events and, and hopefully the U.S. can prevent uh, this conflict from escalating further, but it's important to point out that there's a recurring theme in U.S. policies in the Middle East, and that is that the United States simply does not understand the region, and nor does it really have the interest in understanding uh, um, the region. And now with U.S. policy focusing uh, more to the Far East, it looks that it really doesn't want to understand the region um, um, at all, and that ends up hurting both U.S. interests, but it also up, uh, ends up hurting the, um, the Middle East at large. Biden's speech on the, uh, um, I believe it was on, on Monday of last week, um, and then um, on Blinken's speech, were both received very positively in Israel, but at the same time, they were received very positively among public opinion um, um, in the Arab world. And that kind of uh, contributed to the nerves on both sides um, um, being a little bit more tighter. On the one hand, in Israel, there was this talk that um, Israel has now complete freedom to act as it wishes, Blanche, as many people have been saying over the last week. And now we're starting to see that um, um, Israel is actually moving away from that position. We've been seeing American officials talk a lot more about stressing the need uh, to abide by international law. Blinken, uh, Anthony Blinken, has actually taken part today um, in the cabinet meeting. This is the first time since 1973 that a U.S. Secretary of State has taken uh, part in a cabinet meeting. Um, many experts have been saying that that's just to keep a watchful eye on the Israeli cabinet, that Israel doesn't go completely berserk. We've seen also in the Arab world a very negative response, especially to Blinken's speech. It was conceived as if he's taking sides for, re re uh, for uh, religious reasons, and that obviously does not help. Hence, Sisi's speech, which was applauded by many in the Arab world, including those that are not big fans um, of Sisi, who spoke about the fact that um, there's religious extremism on both sides, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important that the U.S. pay attention to the fact that it is the only power that can lead to a positive change. And in order to do that, it has to be a lot more smarter than it has been so far. Thank you.
Thank you so much there. I appreciate you and all the other speakers, Mia and Mawa and Scott. Um, let me kind of get the ball rolling before we turn to the Q&A and ask you, you know, we're, I think that for the most part, we're all social scientists, we're all political scientists of different kinds, perhaps. Uh, what is the next step? Where are we now? What should we expect to see in the next day, two, three? Um, militarily, politically, um, strategically, going back to Mauva's point, perhaps, um, what are we anticipated to see? What should we pay attention to, if you wish? Um, uh, let's go with Mauva, uh, go ahead. I think uh, the most important thing right now is whether there will be this opening of the Ga uh, Rafah border to get uh, humanitarian aid into Gaza exclusively into Gaza and um, have the foreign nationals, the Americans and other nationality um, passport holders to leave Gaza. But this, uh, there was a media kind of spinning the past few days about this idea of the exodus of Palestinians into Sinai and Egypt has been so adamant about that. That's a non-starters. And um, it has to, we have to be very careful with that because every country in the region, part of what uh, Sarah was saying that the United States doesn't understand that re the region, perhaps that's Blinken's, uh, you know, uh, shortcoming there is that there are red lines, there are national security issues for each of these partner in the region. And you cannot mess with Egypt about, you know, uh, this. It's not about humanitarian refugee. Why don't you have some camps? This is uh, the idea of, you know, the end of the Palestinian cause and also the, the lack of sovereignty over Sinai. Egypt fought a war back in 1973 and made the peace so that that's clear, you know. So the any insinuation, any uh, uh, suggestions of that is is stepping too much on, on Egypt's turf and, and that is so important. So I think the, the, the first thing to look at is whether Israel will allow this humanitarian uh, influx of goods and, and all of that and cut, the, you know, end the siege it has, which is strategically it's having so that it creates this kind of, the, the people are so much suffering that they will kind of regime change kind of wars. And we've seen where these regime change wars ended and they were not successful. So I think this strategically from Israel, it has to listen to the partners, has to listen to the feedback coming about that. Uh, that's the first thing to look at. And uh, then, of course, this idea of the second front, whether there will be something on the northern side of Israel, like South, South Lebanon, Hezbollah. I think also this, you know, pushing Hamas, uh, pushing Gaza to be, a, an, I call it unfightable uh, fight because you don't have the space for it to really do the fighting. And any ground uh, invasion uh, might not be really in Israel's um, uh, advantage at all. It's uh, it's urban warfare. Uh, it doesn't know the the, the streets. It's going to be a lot of you know uh, surprises there. And obviously, um, Hamas is prepared and has asked for it, so it understands that this is that could be coming. So it would be interesting to see that maybe geographically and because of the of the givens uh, militarily you would have to have the war up uh, north. And the, so very unintended consequences, what I'm trying to say. Uh, we're shooting for something and then something else completely happens. You're assuming something, uh, assuming that Egypt would take the, the, the Palestinians because of economic, I don't know what. This is just nonsense, you know? This is not understanding Egypt. This is not understanding Jordan or Saudi Arabia, for that matter, who all told this message to Blinken. So... It's just like not like we have, I think that what's here and then from now to the next few steps is to kind of question the assumptions one has about the, the regional players uh, and then look at what is the strategy and whether that is actually achievable. Um, so this is kind of like what I wanted to say. I got you. Uh, Mia Bloom, please, my friend, go ahead. It was just to follow on from what... Um... Dr. Marwa was saying, I have very close friends in Beirut, and uh, from their perspective, Hezbollah is not particularly 
uh, popular. And in fact, they don't want to be pulled into the war. But apparently within the camps, there are a lot of Palestinian factions, that there's a lot of internecine conflict. And I apologize that it sounds like I'm promoting my own theory. But, you know, in my work, when I talked about multiple different groups that might end up being in competition with one another, you do have a tendency for an escalation of violence and this ratcheting up, you know, uh, what I previously called outbidding. So I do think that, you know, as far as if you went to the fantasy of Uslub al-Mirahil, which is the pal like the PLO's old fantasy of a of a conflict in, in stages, um, Hamas would see nothing better than to see Israel fighting not just a two-front, but maybe even a three-front war with the West Bank and with um, Hezbollah in the north. But I think it's very clear from Abbas's statement that the West Bank is not really eager to get involved. And Lebanon is really not eager, and they are trying to, to tamp down any of Hezbollah or these Palestinian militias in the pulling them in to, to, to a conflict that they're not. We, lo we lost your sound, Mia. You're muted. I stopped talking because I wanted to give someone else a chance. Oh, I, I'm sorry. My apologies. All righty. Scott Lasensky, my friend, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll just add one point to the list that I gave earlier on U.S. policy. Um, there's one arena that we hadn't focused on heavily in past conflicts, and that's the domestic arena here at home. Uh, I would say Liz Sherwood Randall, who's the head of the Homeland Security Council, um, and, and those in our federal government who focus on, on law enforcement, on protecting communities at home, um, unlike in past conflicts, so there, there were some hints of this during the, the, the shorter conflict in, in 2021. Um, but there's real concerns about spillover of violence and inner community uh, uh, attention here here at home, the killing and the, um, the attack of a, on a family in Chicago, uh, the sort of total sense of panic you see around a Jewish community, uh, uh, Jewish communities all over the country. Um, it, it's real. Uh, and if there was spillover in domestic scenes in the UK or France or other countries and in past conflicts, you, you, there, there's a sense that it's on the agenda now where it hasn't been before. Um, uh, and I just want to add one other point. Um, um, it'll, 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 it, boy, it, it, it comes quick and then it slips away. Um, sorry, in the q and I was sorry, I'm jumping ahead real quick, Eli, if you don't mind, I looked at some of the questions. While my so, so hold on, just hold off, hold off to that, please. So uh, sure, sure, sure. Note. On the Hamas questions, when you're ready, on the two. Yeah. So uh, fair, briefly, so we can move to the Q and A, my friend. Go ahead. Yeah, just just very quickly about what happens next. Um, according to at least leaks that we're seeing in um, the Israeli press, um, there is going to be a regional um, conference um, in Egypt in the next coming days. There's even leaks that Biden um, is going to participate, not only Blinken. Um, that that's very important to see where the developments go from there. And obviously, everybody's eyes at the moment are on the Lebanon-Israel border because if if Lebanon obviously if Hezbollah obviously interferes, then we're in a regional war which has completely different dynamics. Excellent. Okay, so let's turn to the Q and A. We'll and you know we'll we'll get the poll rolling. And if you wish to comment on somebody else's, feel free. Again, as, as I said at the beginning, this is a conversation more than anything else. Um, uh, Mia, this is a question to you, uh, Mia Bloom. How is, I think the it's in the sentence relates to the attack itself. How is it bad for Iran or Hamas? Um, is it is there a way to frame it as a net positive for both actors? I mean, as far as Iran's ability to project power, um, I think I read an analyst today that said that at least in the last four years, any terrible tragedy that's occurred in the Middle East can trace itself back to Iran. Iran uh, Iran plays a bad actress or spoiler role. So this is something that they do. And in fact, um, I mean, if you if you're playing if you're thinking about them strategically, it suits them quite fine to have this chaos and this and disarray. Like it fits within this idea in within their ideology. As far as hurting Hamas, I think it'll hurt Hamas in the sense of, um, and I've I've spent a lot of time in Qatar, and I know the royal family quite well. Uh, mostly the the people involved with the Doha Forum. Uh, they're not going to be excited about having Mashad and Hanaya there 
and sort of the focus. You know, they just recently got rid of the blockade. And so the idea of being isolated because they are keeping, reminds me a little bit of the reaction after the Gulf War in Kuwait against the Palestinians. Like I suspect that the Qataris were going to make uh, whatever leadership that is very safely ensconced and their children are far from this conflict um, in Qatar, a little bit less uh, welcome. So there is a long term. So it's not just as as Dr. Marra was saying that there that Israelis are going to go in and 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 wreak havoc and start target assassinating. As we've seen, two Hamas leaders already have been killed, but uh, within Gaza. But I think that also the reputation it and and I'll and I'll link it to something specific. When we first heard about the way that women and children were being treated, and there was initially this like reaction that Hamas was acting like ISIS. A bunch of my friends who were in Jordan were like, reminded them of the immolation of Muad Qatathbe, that not that ISIS had a lot of support throughout the Arab world, but that was a line in the sand. And I think the killing of babies or the kidnapping of old people and young girls in order to engage, you know, to treat them like um, Sabiya, like the way they treated the Yazidi girls, you know, that does not sit, the, the people are not comfortable so that they can support the Palestinian cause. And of course, most people in the Arab world support Palestinian self-determination, but this is a maybe a bridge too far. So this is where, for the gentleman who asked in the Q&A, I think there is a backlash as evidence becomes more available because initially in the fog of war, people can say, oh, it's fake news and this didn't happen and we don't believe it. And then when it starts being validated and then you have Anderson Cooper going in and validating it and God forbid I, I was disgusted, but like the prime minister's office releasing photos of the babies. I mean, this is no, no matter who it is, a parent is a parent is a parent. They're going to look at that photo and be absolutely disgusted by the time. Was muted. My apologies. So this leads me to the next question, perhaps kind of dovetailing uh, Mia Bloom's comments. Is there a way to kind of to segregate Hamas from from the Palestinians in the in the in the Gaza Strip, or perhaps in the West Bank as well, or in general, Palestinians per se around the world? Is there a way to say, as, as Mia said, perhaps this is a breach too far. This this group is too radical, too violent, too aggressive, too barbaric, and we need to kind of to create some kind of daylight between the people and this organization. Uh, Thayer, you want to give it a go, Mawa? Um, Thayer, you want to go first? I don't think so. Actually, um, believe it or not, the way Hamas acted in this attack, it uh, it gave it a, a, a proximity to actual organized armed forces than just like run of the mill single attacks here and there terrorists this some stabbing the way it was organized enough it's almost that what the palestinians are going to be craving perhaps not only a state but an organized armed forces that can have good relations with 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 other formal armed forces as opposed to be the non-state um, uh, actors, the militants, the terrorists, the, the ones that abide by no rules. So like ironically, there is now perhaps a need uh, from the Israeli side, believe it or not, to have a Palestinian state, an entity that have regular and organized armed forces so that you don't have to deal with the very irregularity of uh, uh, of aspects of the attack because one aspect of the attack that it had combined arms it used land sea and air so these are features of what an armed forces would have as kind of combined arms so that's the surprise and that's the the wow factor but then the other factor is like it targeted civilians it targeted people so then it's as if if you want a future where the civilians are not targeted and you want like state on state action or none of action like that kind of deterrence you have between Egypt and Israel after years of wars like the kind of peace that is very stable 40 years and counting because both of them tested one another and don't want to get there but they are states right they have armed forces regular forces so it's almost believe it or not 
out of this kind of uh, atrocities, you might actually need a, a, a reliable Palestinian state next door. And that is my that might be completely uh, you know uh, unbelievable right now that I'm saying that, but I am always looking ahead like twenty and thirty years ahead when I when I say things. So um, that's just what I want to say about that. Alrighty, comments. Scott, you're unmuted. You want to yeah, do real quick. I agree with Marwa hundred percent. I would just uh, draw one lesson. Sometimes the lessons of the past are applicable. In the 2014 war, that was 50 plus days, summer of 2014, uh, I was in the U.S. government. We, we surprised ourselves actually by coming up with an arms embargo for Gaza, a very strict, a tough international legal framework for limiting arms. Sanctions regimes aren't perfect, um, but, but you know we have them. Take North Korea, for example. The deal fell through for a variety of reasons, mostly because of an inadvertent opposition on the behalf of Abu Mazen. But um, the international community multilaterally has largely stood by in terms of building this kind of architecture, legal architecture, international legal architecture around the question of arms and armaments in Gaza. And that's something that I, I, I'm sure our own government and, and allied governments are working on. But there'll only be a moment of opportunity. The window will close soon in terms of international, um, um, uh, in terms of an international um, a, a critical mass and support. In fact, it may even be out of reach given the, the deep, deep divisions that have set in the Security Council due to, to Russian and, and, and Chinese obstructionism. Um, but that's something I think that should be on the table. And again, to, I, I reiterate what, what Marwa said, uh, bolstering those that we do work with, uh, the, not just Israel, but especially the US. We've got a 30 year relationship with the Palestinian Authority. And unfortunately, we're kind of at a moment, the last 10 months in particular, where it's, a, it's an absolute low rock bottom uh, period in terms of Israeli uh, uh, PA relations and and uh, bolstering those Palestinians who we um, who we can work with and who are um, who who are willing to choose another path uh, should certainly be high on our agenda. All righty, so I see that Mia Bloom has raised her hand. Phil, you wanted to chime in, or do you want to? I'll wait for the next question. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for your flexibility, my friend. Mia, go ahead. I just wanted to jump in for something. I mean, no disrespect, I'm somewhat dis with the idea of having uh, rewarding this uh, this this terrible attack. You know, in other words, there is a template that we've seen in the past that is successful, whether it's the Basque separatists in Spain, ETA, or the provisional IRA in Ireland, that you separate out the people from the extremists within the group and you create these political factions. Of course, there's going to be some uh, fringe groups that are that try to play a spoiler role, but I think it's a I think, unless it's just me, I think we lost Mia. I think we are. If you provide the, the. Alrighty, I think she, she, there's some. Or did I lost you? Oh, there you go. You want to try it again? We are frozen, but we can't hear you. Can you hear me? No. Yeah. Let, we'll... let me see if that works better. The, okay. Can you hear me if I don't yeah, have the video? Can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say is we have, a, we have a template from from ETA, the Basque separatists, and the Provisional IRA in Northern Ireland that you need. You, you basically have to disarm the groups and then deal with the underlying grievances of the population. If you can separate the population from the extremists, then we actually have a successful plan of action. Because the problem will be up until now, we have no history of any terrorist group that's ever achieved anything using violence. And I think it would set a very bad precedent if anyone tried to integrate Hamasawis into a future Palestinian state. I think the only option would be Hamas. Thank you so much. So a question to Thayer, who gave Mawa the, the right of, of way just recently. Um, which countries do you propose intervene to solve the conflict? Because you talked about regional as well as international actors and global actors. Can you identify one or two, or who do you think is both in a position of power and influence and also has honorable intentions? 
So um, honorable intentions, that's a problem in the greater Middle East, unfortunately. But uh, first and foremost, with all due respect to the rise of China and any other global actors, the United States remains the indispensable power in, in, in the region. It is the only country that has so much cloud on all the other actors um, um, in the greater Middle East that without the United States, nothing can move forward. But here's the issue. The United States has to be a good faith actor. It has to be an actor that does not clearly take sides because that de-incentivizes uh, one side to not move forward. Um, um, so that's the first point. You obviously cannot overlook Egypt. I mean, people tend to talk about the Gulf countries. With all due respect to the Gulf countries, nobody can play the role that Egypt plays, not just because of the role of, of geography, but even the role of political clout and destiny uh, as a whole. You need to bring in uh, the Egyptians. You need to bring in the Jordanians. And only then can we think about um, the Gulf countries. You know, there's this general idea in the Middle East that if you just throw money on an issue, it will somehow, you know, um, um, solve the crisis or temporarily at least. That does not work because what ends up happening is interest groups tend to take that money, but at one point the uh, contradictions of the Middle East tend to uh, blow up in your face. So what we need is, first of all, the United States, the actors, um, um, the neighboring countries, Egypt, first and foremost, Jordan, and then the other Arab countries uh, to come in. Um, you need to support the Palestinian Authority and by support, again, not only economically, but politically, you need everybody to stand by them. In this case, you might need the Palestinian Authority also to change its kind of behavior. You need to have a clear succession of what's gonna happen at the end of the day, Abu Mazen is in his mid eighties, extremely unpopular. Maybe it's time we also work on that front that we understand who is going to lead the Palestinian Authority, reinforce its institutions, um, um, because you cannot just simply have the Palestinian Authority come, um, come on the tanks of the Israeli army to come in and kind of solve the problem. That's not going to work. So this is how you need to think about it. It's not going to be easy, and it's going to take time, but there is a solution to this in the long run. You need to re you need, We need to work back the clock to before 2007, but have an institutionalized Palestinian authority that can, on the one hand, solve the economic and social problems in Gaza, but also, not less importantly, give people a, a belief that there is a better future in the horizon. And that's something that did not exist before 2007. Thank you so much there. Uh, Scott Lesensky, uh, there's a question about the, the probable, possible, likely or not Israeli occupation of the Gaza Strip as a result of the attack last week. Can you talk about what's the American position? Is it something that will fly with, uh, with the White House, with the Biden White House now? Is it an option if, if the Americans have a way to kind of to, to weigh in? Um, is this likely? Is this something that the, the United States can, can support? Uh, uh, Sure, that's a good. It's a good question. I don't work in the U.S. government. Uh, no, no, no. As an observer, not as, no, a, as a... It's just my. It's just my caveat. I don't work in the U.S. government. I have not been in the U.S. government for for um, a few years, so I don't know what the kind of plans on the shelf are and policies on the shelf. Uh, I, I would imagine that any kind of Israeli presence in the Gaza Strip, beyond um, a purposeful military operation to target. Uh, points of threat is not something that the U.S. would support. I uh, can't say that definitively, but I'm 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 um, uh, I, I'm speculating. Uh, I have pretty good reason to speculate, but that's um, um, I, you know I think and I, and I can sort of give you a metaphor, like a, a point of comparison. As limited as these are, in the 2014 war, uh, the longest so far of the of the conflicts in Gaza. There was a sense we, I mean, I can tell you, we asked the, it's reported, it's not uh, state secrets. Uh, we asked Israel to not take uh, ground operations. Um, and um, they, they held off for quite a long time. Uh, they did later on after some incidents and concerns about tunnels. But um, um, an Israeli presence over the line, I think, is something that the U.S. wouldn't support. Um, it, um, it wouldn't. Thank you so much, Scott. Always good to hear some insiders, albeit from 2014. Um, uh, Mahler, can, I this... quick, can I just add real quick? There's there's just a style point here. People who are sort of close observers of, of President Biden, Joe Biden's been in public office for, for a very long time, even before he was vice president, his, his approach to Israel, um, and I watched as vice, when he was vice president, his approach to Israel has a, has a different tone and flavor sometimes in public. Than behind the scenes, uh, we're seeing some some whispers that Thayer mentioned just the changes of policy that are being articulated publicly now. But 
again, I'm speculating, but um, it, I'm offering um, those who are participating in this webinar a sense of his, his particular style in terms of Israel, his own sense of how you reassure and relate to in public um, Israel, how, how one keeps um, domestic politics, both in Israel and in our country, which are you know relatively important factors, not determining factors, but important ones, how you sort of keep them at bay. And it's just a particular style. There's style in foreign policy. His style is very different from, um, from President uh, Obama, for example, when it comes to dealing with Israel. Excellent. Thank you so much for the follow up. Um, Mawa, can you unpack based on a question that is in the in the Q&A box? You talked about the, the position of Egypt vis-a-vis -vis Gaza and the refugee question about allowing this uh, humanitarian corridor going into uh, Sinai. Can you kind of unpack perhaps what is the Egyptian concern? What is the what is their fear? Okay, so the question itself is asking whether why Egypt as an Arab neighbor to Gaza kind of doesn't have an obligation to take refugees, at least to allow them passage. No, it doesn't have. And then there is a follow up question about who has that obligation. Actually, Israel has that obligation. So um, the obligation is to maintain the civilian and treat them well and under uh, warfare law laws, etc., is that actually Egypt would be helping Israel if it allows this humanitarian end so that it gets off the news that it's uh, committing war crimes and, and all of this. But Egypt has no obligation um, uh, except to the, the Palestinian state itself that, uh, I mean, imagine an exodus of 2 million into Sinai. This is the end of the Palestinian population and state and whatever. So actually, Egypt owes it to the Palestinians not to allow for this kind of forced migration into Sinai. And then second, Egypt's own sovereignty and own uh, uh, borders, it will not allow or muse Israel in this kind of issue that it has with the Palestinians to kind of uh, send a population of millions onto Egypt. And Egypt, by the way, did not receive um, uh, um, uh, huge numbers of uh, refugees from any other uh, war because it doesn't believe that, you know, when the refugees leave, they were not going to come back. So in a sense, these are the real concerns of like, this is un kind of like unacceptable, but um, it, it cares so much to send in the, the, the humanitarian life lines and all of that. So that's why it's emphasizing, it's not like turning its back against the Palestinians by saying, I don't care at all, but it has national security interests. It has borders to protect, it has sovereignty, and it's not gonna just like use Israel in this just because, no. So that's Egypt's position. Thank you so much. Uh, Thayer has his hand up in the air. Go ahead, my friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I wanted to continue what uh, Dr. Mar was talking about, especially from the Palestinian perspective that, this is actually an issue where, where the Palestinians in Egypt see the situation very similarly. One of the big secrets about, you know, the siege on Gaza and whenever Israel was, uh, whenever somebody would uh, challenge Israel on the siege, well, Israel would always say, look, it's not only us, it's Egypt. Why doesn't anybody, you know, pressure Egypt on this issue? And um, from an Egyptian and from an also a Palestinian perspective, the argument is that Israel wants to throw the Gaza question onto Egypt. And that's why Palestinians have generally not attacked Egypt on, on the issue of the siege. They might want to see more help in that sense, more, more political help, but there's this general understanding that if Egypt opened the border, then over time, um, Gaza will become a, an Egyptian issue, not an Israeli issue, and the Palestinians want, first of all, it's important for them to maintain a, a good relationship with Egypt as much as possible, but also um, this understanding that they would be serving an Israeli interest if Basically, they started pushing more and more on the Egyptians. So there's this general belief amongst the Palestinian population in Gaza and the West Bank that you should tread carefully with Egypt. You should not push Egypt's red lines because if you do, you would be basically serving an Israeli interest. That's how the Palestinians look at it. And there is this follow-up question about Palestinians fleeing northern. So where should they go? I think, uh, as I say, the aid goes in. And then there, if, if there's anything, it should be Mediterranean. So get ships, do something this way. But don't even think about Sinai. That's an interesting comment. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Very uh, enlightening. Okay. Um, uh, hold on. Where was I? Um, 
uh, Scott, um, perhaps referring to something that Thayer actually said, what does the United States need to understand in the region that it doesn't understand now? And I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to go to you first as a former, not present, former U.S. government employee. What, what didn't you, quote unquote, or don't you, writ large, understand about the region? And, and Thayer might, may have his own uh, points, but I wanted to hear from you, kind of from the inside the beast, quote unquote. Um, I don't know about the beast, but I'll, I'll refer Thayer back to, uh, and though we're not in the same city right now, we'll have to have a hallway conversation at some point on campus. Uh, you pick the hall. Um, um, th there's a U.S. Institute of Peace series about um, about negotiations, about about the culture of negotiations. I would refer to that and anyone who's interested here. Uh, it was uh, conducted, it was initiated by the late uh, Dr. Richard Solomon. I had the honor of working with him. And it's a wonderful series, 10 or 15 volumes about how different countries negotiate. Um, there's a, actually a joint volume. It's one of the rare joint efforts <laughs> in the terms of this conflict. They published a joint book. It's uh, edited by Tamara Wittes on how Israelis and Palestinians negotiate. The, the um, Palestinian chapter is, is, I believe, particularly strong and has a lot of shelf life. In that series, which ended with um, uh, a collection of, of essays from uh, international diplomats and experts and a and a um, uh, a volume about the United States um, some distinctions about the United States were were pointed out and I will focus on those rather than um, and perhaps I have a respectful disagreement with Thayer about what the U.S. does and doesn't know as a as a third party in the region um, the U.S. often believes you can negotiate a problem you know take it's like the Jim Baker or the Madeleine Albright approach you can come in and you bring enough uh, a goodwill into a negotiation, enough creativity, and every problem is solvable. That's an American bias that sometimes is pointed out. Um, uh, I think the U.S. can walk and chew gum at the same time. I think we have in this U.S. government today, you have a, a people with a lot of experience dealing with um, with the Middle East, with these parties. Um, it's the A-team. It's a cohesive team. I'm not here to market the, uh, the Biden administration, but this is like uh, Bush 41. You've got um, um, an administration without major fissures. If Bush 41 is the, uh, you know, is, the, is the model I would give you, then you know, the, the Trump administration would be the opposite, you know, filled with fissures and backstabbing. Um, it, it's a cohesive administration. It's a, it's a crisis um, uh, tested administration. I think it's it's filled with people now, including my old boss, uh, Dan Shapiro, our former ambassador um, in Israel, just rejoined in a different role, Samantha Power, the head of USAID. I worked for her during the Gaza conflict in uh, 2014 when she was U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Um, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it, it, it may not be, and I don't know if this is what Thayer was, was referring to, but it, you know, it may not be an administration that came into to office three years ago, pointing to this part of the world terms of its major priorities. The president talked, has talked consistently about illiberalism and combating illiberalism and, and anti-democratic forces around the world, climate change, a um, uh, 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 China. Uh, issues have come up that don't spotlight this issue, but foreign policy in many respects uh, is a story of, um, of the decisions made by presidents and their administrations on crises that arise and how they're tested. Uh, this isn't the first administration to come. Uh, and if you look at their agenda on day one, uh, different challenges and 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 um, uh, and tests um, uh, confront them along the way. Uh, I'm very hopeful that this administration can uh, can respond to this test in, in terms of the issues I, I pointed to at the beginning, um, uh, de-escalating the immediate conflict across the Gaza border, border avoiding spillover, um, and finding some way back to a um, 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 a situation that we are our investments in Arab-Israeli peace. Are accruing over time and not we're not sort of falling behind. Alrighty, so um, um, a question from Mia. Um, you've mentioned the terrorist movement's hope for an overreaction from the state, in this case from Israel. Hamas is expecting this overreaction, all in kind of an approach. How can you escape this dilemma? How can you kind of roll back or go counter this internal logic of uh, Hamas's recent attack? Um, what do you think would constitute a more measured response? So what is the, there was a whole debate that I saw on YouTube a couple of days ago about proportionality. How do you, what is the proportional uh, response? What is kind of the, the plausible or accepted? 
Well, so I had put in the chat just for us this uh, one of my favorite quotes that I'd used in my first book, Dying to Kill, where I'm actually quoting Sundara Luminoso in Peru, where they said that the movement's goal was to provoke blind, excessive reactions from the state. Blows laid on indiscriminately would provoke among those unjustly or disproportionately affected an intense resentment of government. And that is exactly what the purpose of terrorism is. It's to elicit a reaction. You want the state to overreact. So, and again, um, I'm I'm not advising the gov the current government, nor would I ever advise this particular government. But you know, when you think about the response after leadership of of people who were responsible for Munich, and it's um, if that's the Spielberg film Munich. Um, Bar Zohar has a wonderful book called The Quest for the Red Prince, which describes the process. We, uh, did, you did, did you lose me again? Yeah, yeah, but now you're good. You're good. Continue, please. Okay, so I'm off so that it, you don't lose me. But I yeah. think that the possibility of having a targeted assassination of leadership to no no nope. i think we're not I no nope. hold on okay so let's let's give you another minute but i think it sounds like you're talking about something more surgical something that is more pinpointed to leaders or leaderships of yes, terrorist it's organizations more specific. way yeah. to more specifically and, and lower levels then maybe you could have something proportional but i think i've lost you no nope, we got the the gist of it um fair so this is a question to you as another israeli so not you're not alone my friend you're here with me i i got you um what are the political implications of the war we're still in the midst of it, or perhaps even yeah. didn't start. But but you know, big picture, thinking about Benjamin Netanyahu, the coalition government. There's a there's an emergency coalition now with Benny Gantz in, with Gidon Saul, Gadi Azinkot, and others. Can you even see, regardless of you know, if regardless of the scenarios, regardless of the outcome, at the end of the day, what will be the political implications of this conflict? So, yeah, I mean, the general feeling in the first 48, 72 hours was that this is Benjamin Netanyahu's Golda Meir moment, right? This is this is a moment where he will not be able to uh, recover from. And the uh, polls that we saw on Friday, I think Marid had a poll, Likud under Netanyahu gets only 19 seats, while Benny Gantz gets 41 seats. That alone should tell us that, you know, he's in a dire situation. But I think Netanyahu is a different animal. Um, at least he feels this way that he can somehow get out of this, especially if this whole situation from a military perspective, a perspective ends a little bit differently. I personally do not tend to think that that's what will happen. Uh, Netanyahu is a very divisive figure. And right now, Israel has just, just suffered its biggest catastrophe. You can make the argument since 1948. So there's no, I don't see a way where he's going to get out of this. Once this war ends, don't be surprised if you see a million man demonstrations in, in the streets of Tel Aviv asking uh, or demanding that Netanyahu uh, leaves office. The fact that he still has all of uh, all of his legal troubles will make him try to hold on. Um, at the end of the day, this government, this coalition is a pretty tight knit coalition, but cracks will begin to happen eventually um, uh, once uh, once the fighting ends. So if you ask me personally, I think we are in the beginning of the end of the Netanyahu era. That being said, Netanyahu is not going to give up very easily. And he personally believes that he does have a pathway out of this to remain um, in the prime minister's office, which, again, I do not see a possible. One year from now, Israel will, will have a different prime minister. So, so kind of follow up on the political side of it. And again, going back to Scott, with your permission, as somebody who teaches about U.S. foreign policy, um, is Biden... Biden's visit, there's a supposedly there's a visit happening this Wednesday. Is it designed to prevent Benjamin Netanyahu from doing more than what the administration wants him to do? Or is it a way for the administration to try and control him by having, by deploying uh, U.S. government 
people on the ground. So you can't go into a major offensive while the president of the United States is in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. I think if you ever, Eli, want to take a different job, you should write a th diplomatic thrillers because that, that was a tremendous um, narrative. Um, it would make David Ignatius jealous at the Washington Post. He's written some great thrillers as well. I, um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. I appreciate your, your speculating. Um, I think there's a certain degree of improvisation based on past practices, but there's a certain degree of improvisation. Uh, uh, despite Kissinger's famous quote uh, uh, that Israel doesn't have a foreign policy, only domestic politics. Uh, I, I feel the, the, the core of the uh, Biden administration response is purposeful. It is intended to address those goals that I pointed to earlier um, uh, about uh, uh, dealing with Israel in terms of um, uh, reaching some goals, achieving greater safety for Israel, but also capturing and achieving other goals. We have broader ones, uh, not just avoiding a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. And they're using the tools that they think are necessary. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm actually quite, um, I was pleasantly surprised to see that the Secretary of State, uh, Anthony Blinken, is, is, is taking his time, is not rushing out of the region, um, is being adaptive in his sh shuttle diplomacy. Um, again, I, I, it's, I know many of the players from my own time in government, and it's a surprisingly cohesive group. I wouldn't say it's a group of sort of, you know, people who just say, you know, just say yes, there's r robust discussions, I'm sure. Um, I would say it's also probably very tense, and I would just, you know, give a shout out to our diplomats on the ground. Um, there's a notion that American diplomats are, you know, often in garden spots and not in, in hot spots. I, I think the, the team who works led by Stephanie, uh, Stephanie Hallett, um, the charge in Israel should be commended. They're dealing with an incredibly dynamic situation. It unfolded on a Saturday, uh, and given the time zones, uh, Stephanie Hallett was the first U.S. government uh, person to respond, uh, managing an evacuation, uh, supporting uh, the Secretary of State, dealing with the diplomacy. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a rather modestly sized embassy for those who don't know. Um, um, it would shock uh, Eli and colleagues of ours who are in academic departments. It's certainly bigger than most major university academic departments, but it's a relatively modest and even in non times of war, the unending stream of congressional visits and other visits through Israel uh, makes it one of the most hardest working missions out there for the United States government. And I just want to sort of commend our people in the field and also here at the State Department. They're in crisis mode and working 24 seven. And I think we should all be grateful. So outside US government, but still very sympathizing with Thank you so much, Scott. Um, Mawa, so somebody kind of pushed back against your your um, your answer, and I thought that it would be only fair for you to kind of to respond. I saw it, I see it on your face that you you've seen that. Um, the argument is for the, those who are listening is that um, your your claim that the Egyptians are you know won't accept any Palestinian refugees or Palestinians moving south through the Rafah crossing, um, you know, is kind of a weak explanation or a weak kind of a excuse, so to speak. My apologies if, if this was not the intention. No, it's, um, it's clear. In the, the case study, another person talks about uh, absorbing Ukrainian refugees. Let me right. be very clear. The region, uh, Egypt, Israel, actually, for that matter, look at this, this Ukraine case as a mess. You, this Ukraine was not a successful case of uh, uh, of uh, supporting a partner and then reaching some uh, good outcome. This idea of having these refugees leaving their country and their country being destroyed, that's not in Egypt's policies and that's nothing to wish the Palestinians to leave Gaza and go somewhere or leave the West Bank and be in Jordan. That is actually not how the the state, uh, like the Egyptian state or the Jordanian state, look at the affairs, nor their populations look at that, and nor do they think that this is a good thing for the Palestinians. So it's not even a thought to be entertained to say, have two million people leave Gaza and maybe they will be refugees in Egypt. That's not good for the Palestinians. That's why the Egyptian uh, state and the polity would not uh, like or accept any of that. Um, and that temporality of it, sometimes or maybe just temporary. Nothing is temporary uh, once you leave, especially in the Palestine-Israel situation. Historically, you leave, you don't go back. So th this is not even something to be entertained or joked about or taken lightly. And probably that's exactly why Blinken is staying in the region, because he was supposed to make the tour, go to Israel, then make the tour with the Arab countries, end with Egypt, and maybe go back 
and that's the end of the tour. He had to go back to Israel to pass the note from Egypt about what it's going to do or not do about that uh, crossing. Uh, the refugee, no refugee, no exodus, no kicking Palestinians out of Gaza. None of these scenes are going to be accepted from Egypt, nor from Jordan or Saudi Arabia for that matter. So I hope that explains it. My apologies, I'm almost muted. Yeah, 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 I'm back, I'm back. Um, Mia, there's a whole debate about Hamas's terroristic attacks and the Israeli response, and in part, you kind of addressed that. Um, you're slightly frozen, so I'm not so sure you're still here. Oh, you can you can hear me. Okay, excellent. Um, so is there a way to create an equivalency of sorts? So the Hamas was horrible, horrible, gorish, horrible, but... The Israeli uh, uh, response, as one uh, one of the attendees asked, isn't it on the same level? Is it different? Can we categorize that differently, perhaps, kind of a, from a scholarly perspective, from a kind of a, 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 a research methods kind of a perspective? I mean, I think the problem is going to be that there's an interpretation on the one hand that Israel is seeking revenge. And so, as you mentioned before, and as Thayer mentioned about this carte blanche, that because this is the largest single mass since the Holocaust, you, there's no one in Israel who doesn't know someone. Um, and so they all feel very personally affected. It would be the equivalent population-wise of an attack that killed 35,000 Americans. Like you can't, if you think that 9-11 was bad, Imagine, imagine it 10 times the scale. So the problem is that they're going to have to temper the reaction on the Israeli part. But as far as, you know, the whether a state acts like a non-state actor, I think if the Israeli state went into, let's say, uh, 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 like um, Khan Yunus into a dormitory and started one by one shooting students, uh, that 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 would definitely raise eyebrows. Like that's not something Israel could or would do. But would Israel drop a bomb and not care if there were civilians? That is something that Israel would and has done. So I think that this is the differentiation that I'm making. And and if I was to use a criminological approach to the person who asked the question, it's a fair question. But I would say it reminds me in in of intent. You know, for example, the difference between manslaughter one and two or murder one and two is a premeditation. And I don't think that when Israel is dropping bombs on buildings, I don't think they care. And you can have a conversation about whether they value Palestinian life the same way as Israeli life. And we know the answer is no, but it's very different from deliberately. And we've seen the deliberate targeting of young people and students in, you know, like places like Pakistan or ISIS or other groups, but we generally don't see it by states other than, well, I mean, Russia. Okay, let me not open up another can of worms in the last minute. So indeed, so the last, this is the last, the last section. So um, I like this quote by Yogi Berra. It is difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. And I'm an, I'm a, an endless intolerable optimist in a way. So what is the best case scenario moving now in a sentence, if you have one? What is the best case scenario moving forward? What would be kind of an ideal win-win situation of sorts? I understand it's impossible in many ways, but for you know, what would make you feel like there's a way out, there's a light at the end of the tunnel kind of a thing? Uh, who wants to go first? Nobody. Go. Oh, sure. go ahead, my friend, okay. then we have Mawa. Go ahead. Sure. Very, very quickly, it's always important to remember that whenever you have a major crisis, that also means there's an opportunity. We tend to forget that with all the emotions, and this has been very emotional time in these last 10 days, but with every crisis, there is an opportunity. Now, to tell you how exactly that would look like, it's hard to say, but I would like to see um, the Middle East play a much more active role diplomatically. We need to find a way 
to bring back the clock to pre-2007, um, where uh, we actually have real state institutions in the Gaza Strip that would begin um, to rebuild uh, the, to be rebuild Gaza. Um, you need to have the Palestinian Authority play a much, much larger role. Again, how does that happen? I really don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But that's what we need to be thinking about. We need to think about how um, um, from this deep crisis we find a way for um, the beginning of a process that would eventually lead to a more lasting situation. I'm not going to use the word peace because we're not there yet, but a more lasting uh, situation. And that only goes through having much greater uh, political, uh, excuse me, not economic, but political support for the Palestinian Authority to play a much bigger role in Gaza. I do think that is possible. It won't be easy, but it is possible. Excellent. Thank you so much. Mawa was next. Please go ahead. The best case scenario moving forward, given everything that we know. In this case in particular, perhaps uh, diplomacy would uh, work in the next week or so, so the ground um, invasion might not even happen because I think I fear for even the IDF soldiers getting into that, lots of ambush is gonna be a, a quagmire. So if there is some delay and delay and Israel is kind of like can climb down from the situation and then there is a release of the hostage and then there is a recognition of the importance of a state because I think for the past four, four years, I personally had kind of dropped the idea of a Palestinian state. I don't think it's coming. It's It's been, been re rendered irrelevant. And I think we, I personally have to revise all of this given the situation. So maybe actually, back to what Sarah saying, institutionalization and actually building much more of institutions, including an, a formal armed forces, believe it or not. So I think that would be the best case scenario where everybody kind of get a, a wake up call for where we are. The hostages are released. There's not a, a, an invasion that would get a, a, the IDF in real trouble and maybe even a recognition that there needs to be a Palestinian state after having forgotten about that and thinking that we can dump them on the Sinai or something, all of this oh, stuff. Excellent. Mia Bloom, what's uh, the best case scenario? Hopefully it'll be stable. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that the moderator mentioned, I think the first thing is we need to get the hostages home. I don't think that anything can happen um, that has a happy ending or a possible happy ending without the hostages being returned. This includes hostages from members of other countries, including I think there's 22 Americans left. Yep. Um, I would say that, you know, again, according to people like I and Lustig, the two-state solution is dead. Maybe a united non-Jewish democratic state, either a democratic state of Israel that fully embraces the Palestinians and gives them full citizenship, or alternatively, uh, Hamas, since they took over in 2007, hasn't allowed for elections. So we don't actually know how popular they are. If there were elections and a lot of the leadership was uh, had lost all their credibility, that there is a possibility of a better leadership in Gaza, more closely, like Thayer said, more closely connected to the West Bank and to Fatah. But you know, your choices are either a two-state solution or a unified state that is not a Jewish state. And, and I, both of those, I think, are a little bit still in the realm of fantasy. Thank you so much. Scott Lasensky, you have the final word or the final prediction. Mm -hmm. A ceasefire uh, and the resolution of the hostage question. I'd agree with the Marwa. Uh, without either of those, we're going to have um, tremendous degree of es uh, prospects of escalation, uh, nightmare scenarios, diplomatic security, human. Uh, at this point, moving into day 11, an end of fighting relatively soon, as soon as possible, uh, a ceasefire that that's that's that holds uh, in a resolution of the hostage issue um, without getting over those two short term necessities. Um, very few positive outcomes are going to be within reach. All righty, folks, thank you so much for coming. I know it was a very difficult conversation because the topics are both complicated, extremely sensitive, extremely charged, especially here and there. If you know somebody, if you have family somewhere in the region. So I appreciate that. I don't want to say this was a, uh, a great evening because it's difficult given the topic, but thank you so much for providing your perspectives and uh, your insights into this situation. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful, safe night here, there, and everywhere. Thank you for the audience as well. Bye.